the world no longer revolves around you was made 12 years ago, 13 years ago. Um, so it's quite an old work, uh, but it, uh, it's a work that I'm very fond of, out of all the works that I've made. Um, my dad once said to me when I was younger, he said, let the world take a turn. And that saying has stuck with me and I remember it all the time. And I think what he meant by it was that if you're in a situation where you have to make a decision, um, it's sometimes beneficial to leave it a day. So say you have an argument on email with someone and you want to reply an aggressive response because you're quite angry and hurt up. Uh, the best thing to do in that situation is to just let the world take a turn, a revolution, which is obviously 24 hours, because the, the, there is a privilege to hindsight that you don't have in the moment. And that 24 hours gives you a change of perspective. So this work is kind of about that idea. I think like the idea of circles and rotation uh, and orbits is something that's really relative to humankind, although we don't see it very often. Everything really works in cycles. Nature works in cycles. Our bodies work in cycles. Space, lunar calendar works in cycles. And I'm quite obsessed with that idea that what goes around ultimately comes back around. So the work's related to that a little bit. It's um, the big bit, which is the blackboard, the chalkboard, is a drawing that is always executed from a plan that I made, but it's executed by an art student with chalk. Um, and I use the chalk and the blackboard as a sort of suggestion that this is a plan, not a real thing. And it's an architectural model that I made um, on the computer quite a while ago based on Jeremy Bentham's Panopticon Prison. Um, but it's a model for an art school and a museum in one. So traditionally, art schools and the museums don't go together. They're two faces of art. One is where mistakes are made and one is where no mistakes are made. So I had this idea of using this circular orbital Jeremy Bentham prison design for something that was completely different, which was an art school and a museum condensed into one building so that mistakes that were made during the production of art were made visible. Uh, and shown with it on the floor, leaning against the wall, um, which with a, with a screw above it where it should hang, but it's been taken down, is an antique print that I found in Lyon in France years ago of Galileo drawing an orbital kind of diagram, which I guess relates to astrology and astronomy uh, on the wall of an orbital staircase of a castle. So it's, it's, there's a lot of sort of meta narratives that repeat themselves in the work and that kind of reflects this circular um, system or orbital system that the work functions on so the the chalkboard drawing in the artwork is always executed by an art student that lives locally to the museum or gallery where the work's being exhibited and the reason for that is that you have this image of Galileo drawing with chalk in the work, uh, Galileo kind of being the master mind of everything. And you have an art student at the beginning of the trajectory of learning. Um, and the design which, it, which they're drawing for the Panoptic and Art School is, is about this kind of disparity between the master and the student. Because for me, I mean, my Japanese gallerist once told me that you should never get stressed about not achieving in art because you're only truly an artist when you reach about 60 or 70 anyway. Before that, it's just practice. It's just messing around, which makes me feel really good because it makes me feel liberated to make lots of mistakes. And I think when you make lots of mistakes, you come up with lots of ideas because there isn't that pressure on you to, you know, to achieve and to... So I'm quite against the idea of the master. I'm quite into the idea of the amateur. You know, 
my my life, everything that I've done until now has been structured around trying to stay a student and never to be a master. My like lifetime ambition would be to stay at art school for my whole life. So it's a different way of, of looking at achievement. It's also why I don't believe in the notion of practice and repeating something to get better. I believe in the opposite. When you finish something, you move on to something wildly different and you gain experience and diversity through this kind of jumping through realms and never doing the same thing twice. The order in which um, signifiers and inspirational motifs come to me in a work and the way that they're constructed is always different. So the Galileo print, for example, I already have it, but I've also got maybe... 500, 600 other antique prints that I've collected. So, I mean, most of what I do as an artist is collecting stuff and marrying opportunities to ideas. It, I don't sit down and practice. I don't have a practice where I just work away repetitively at the same thing, trying to get better. One day I'll make a music video and the next day I'll write a children's book and the next day I'll design a car and they'll all be artwork. So it's kind of a, an untraditional way to make art, but it's completely ideas-based. And the only way that you can use, truly use ideas as your material or as your colours is to just collect loads and loads and loads and loads of ideas. So the, the office that I'm in, in my studio, is kind of like an archive of ideas of that hundreds of thousands of uh, photos, words, objects. Yeah, it's, it's about the way those things that I collect collide with each other that makes the kind of magic dust that makes it artwork, I think. The neon piece um, is... The neon piece is part of um, a poem that I wrote. Uh, and the way that I make them is, I go through the history books of neon art because there's been a lot of neon art made historically in, you know, in the history of art. And I take characters from different artist signs, so uh, different artist artworks. So there might be a... Um, I don't know, one letter from a Catherine Evans, another letter from a Tracy Emin, another letter from a Maria Garcia Torres. And I will take individual characters and then I'll collage them together into a sentence to, to make a sentence read what I want it to read. And the way that this work is structured is the whole sentence is half of the sentence is the title, the danger in visualizing your own end. And what the neon that is broken actually says is, and you drowned in the legacy of your own recursive stuttering. So it's only, it's the title and the work that make the poetic phrase. So, cause a lot of people, you know, they, a lot of artists use the, use untitled, don't they, for their artworks. But I think it's like, if you have the ability to communicate not just in the artwork, but in gossip and fable making and storytelling and the way the work is photographed and rumour that you spread around the work or the book about the artist or even what the artist wears. All those things give you information to read the artwork. So it's important to me to always use the title to its maximum ability. So in this case, the title can't ever be devoid of the artwork and the artwork can't ever be devoid of the title because it only exists with both parts. Um, and obviously the phrase, the danger in visualizing your own end and you drowned in the legacy of your recursive stuttering, it kind of also relates to this circular idea or orbital idea of the other work. A recursive stuttering or a recursive narrative is to repeat, um, to kind of, um, like the film Groundhog Day, to endlessly go over the same thing again and again and again. Um, 
the work is always shown broken and it's always broken by either me or the curator, collector or museum director, depending on, or gallerist, depending on where it's being shown. Um, and it's left with the broken glass on the floor. Um, and sometimes the um, cleaning staff at a museum do come in and clean it away by accident, which is at, which is like the cliche of contemporary art, isn't it? It's like what everyone jokes about, but it does actually happen. Yeah. The neon is broken because um, I don't want people to be able to read it because I'm a firm believer that it's the absences in artworks that make the artworks interesting, not the things that are actually there. So for me, if I go to a museum and I'm like on the bus on the way home, the work that I will still be thinking about will be the work that I don't understand. And the reason I don't understand it usually is because I wasn't given all the information. There was a space left in the conceptual construction of that work for me to add my own information. So any artwork that is complete and communicates adequately, like verbal language, literary language or design, isn't actually art because art isn't meant to communicate perfectly. It's meant to communicate imperfectly so that it's open to millions of different readings by millions of different people. An artwork that is read the same way by everyone who sees it is usually a pretty bad artwork. I've known Obiashi for years and years and years, and I've spent lots of time with him. Um, and I know him, I feel like I know him quite well as a person, not just a collector. Um, and it's a total honor to be in his collection because I respect him so much. But I think it's also, especially when you're a young artist and you don't have work in many collections, it's a total honor to be in any collection. Because I think when, when I was younger, when I was an artist, I never, to be honest, thought anyone would ever swap money for the things that I was making. That seemed like such a mad idea that that would happen. Um, I never, it never occurred to me that that's how I would survive in the future as an adult. I always thought I would be a teacher or a journalist and I would just do my contemporary artworks like at the weekends or something. So um, I think the first work that's ever bought by a collector or a museum of an artist is always a massively significant memory because a door opens up to a possibility where your main occupation, the way that you, were, you could invest your time for the rest of your life, all of a sudden is solely dedicating yourself to one thing that you totally love. And um, it's, I mean, it's just the, being an artist is the best job in the world, isn't it? You can, especially if you're not bound by craft or bound by this notion of practice. Because then you're, I mean, I think it was Joseph Boyes said, art is the science of freedom. And if you're not bound by craft and not bound by history and tradition and practice, you're totally free. Any idea you have could be real. Like tomorrow I could be a racing car driver and the day after I could redesign the drive, McDonald's drive through attendance uniform. I could do anything I want. I could like choreograph a ballet. I could make a carpet. It's like the possibilities are endless. And, you know, my dad worked in a repetitive job and he said to me once, why do so many artists do the same thing every single day? Because I thought the whole point was not to have a repetitive job, like working in a shop or a factory. It was like, you, can, you finally get to do a job where you can do anything and you just do the same thing again and again and again. There's no logic or rationale in that kind of decision. Um, and it, when he said that, I was, that blew me away a bit. And I thought about it for a long time. And then I just decided that I, my practice as an artist would be about jumping 
from one thing to another and seeing how the different things that I do collide with each other and not trying to make a stylistic signature so people would recognize who I am, but just to research and develop and grow and like kind of embrace the idea of lifelong learning to always be a student and always make mistakes and always be at the front end of experimentation, you know, not conformity, um, just mistake making, positive, happy mistake making. So usually my job requires me to travel about half the year. So I spend like six months of the year away from home usually. And obviously in the, the era that we've lived through, um, I'm, try- I'm always trying to not say what the era is. I had a Zoom call the other day with the curator in LA and we talked for an hour and at the end of it, I thought, wow, I didn't mention COVID once. Neither of us mentioned COVID once. And I thought that's so cool. So I was trying to, but it's quite difficult not to talk about it, but it does get boring after a while. But um, so the main thing for me in that, in the era that we've been in is just reduced geographical mobility. I've not had the ability to travel. And because my practice revolves around the collection and archiving of stimulus and ideas and mini signifiers um, and natural signs and conventional signs and collecting all that stuff, taking photos, writing things down, making sound recordings. Um, I've just been here. So there hasn't been a lot of input, which I found quite frustrating. But on the flip side, I mean, I've never spent... I've never spent a whole year at home with my kids, which is kind of why I've got three kids. And it's the first time I've actually spent the whole year at home. So there's been other benefits to it. And I've found a different sort of, a different Ryan inside me to the Ryan that was before the, this era. Usually the, the works that I make, they, it's hard to explain but all works that I make relate to the conditions and the context that I live through. But I never make artworks that are directly about situations. So I'd never make an artwork about identity politics because it's didactic and boring and straightforward. And you could do it in a number of other different genres you don't need to do it in contemporary art contemporary art for me is about miscommunication and not understanding and the wonder of wonder of all the different meanings that come out of something that is ambiguous so for me to make uh, an artwork about the pandemic or the covid era or anything like identity politics or anything political would be unambiguous and didactic and that would you that would be i mean for me against the entire definition of contemporary art it would be not contemporary art to do that so but saying that everything that we live through can't help but color or tone or shade the work that we make so there is although i've always had a fascination with the theory of time and the kind of the way that the cognition of time cognitive understanding of time it seems a little bit now like um the work that i'm making is about the notion of the pause the break or so i'm just making this these new works called waiting sculptures so there is a flavor of this idea that was provided by the era that we've just lived through. Because essentially I was waiting, wasn't I, for a year. So, um, but I wouldn't directly ever make a work about something because it would just be too, yeah, didactic, I think. 
There's literally uh, a thousand projects that I want to do. My problem is that my life won't be long enough that I will get to realise all the ideas that I already have. I just won't have the time, even if I live till I be very old. And the problem is that's at that moment now with the ideas that I have now. And I'm obviously going to have more ideas as I live. So the accumulation of ideas gets greater. In fact, this is a thing that keeps me awake at night. This is my biggest anxiety is that time is running out and the things that I want to do is increasing. It's quite a, but you know, I just I don't know. I just made a screensaver for a museum in Spain for a computer that you can download for free which is just 365 ideas that I know I won't be able to make. And every day a new one pops up on your screensaver. But I could literally think, could probably make like 500 screensavers to get through. You know, a lot of it as well wouldn't necessarily be banging works. It's not like they'd all be like killer works. Some of them would be works that I do wrong or I make and I spend money making them and then I throw them in the trash. And, um, but I also think like, I love artists that experiment. I don't trust artists really that just make good works. It's very unnatural to have a practice and never make bad works. I think uh, it's not, it's not, it shows there's no real happenstance or creative true creative process happening if every work is brilliant i think not unless she's superhuman or something i don't know 